Hi there. You're listening to the Tech Leaders Podcast, brought to you by Be Digital and Tramshed Tech. Today, you'll be hosted by Gareth Davies. Gareth will help you and our guests navigate some of the industry's most exciting topics, from the challenges of sustainable growth through to continuous innovation and everything in between. These are the -the behind-the-scenes stories from the leaders at the forefront of the digital revolution. So stop typing, close that laptop lid, and tune in for this episode of the Tech Leaders Podcast. I have hired a lot of women who've been on career breaks, and they've been fantastic. Lots of people have done that, but you know, in particular, the ones I've hired have been absolutely amazing. They come with ex- past experiences, obviously not in fintech because there was no such thing then, but they come with with lots of different experiences, and 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 it brings a really rounded element to the team. Louisa Murray exemplifies why there should be more female leaders in the workplace. The banking sector in the late 80s provided a formative backdrop for a highly successful career in recruitment and sales. Following an impromptu meeting in a lift with the current CEO of Rails Bank, Louisa went on to head up their highly successful sales division and is now the chief operating officer and a key figure in one of the UK's most successful fintechs. A passionate advocate of women in tech and a very successful C-level exec in her own right, Louisa shares her thoughts on the current state of gender balance in the workplace and the boardroom. Uh, And we also break down the rise of embedded finance, the importance of listening to your customer and how the fintech space is inevitably going to change the world over the next five years. What a great show, a perfect prelude to many more female guests that we have coming on for you in 2022. Uh, it's Louisa Murray. Louisa, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. Oh, no problem at all. I've been really excited about this one. Um, we've got a Women in Tech series coming up soon, and this is a perfect prelude to this. Uh, so I think there's a couple of things to cover. But first of all, uh, I want to know about your amazing career. Not wanting to go through all of that in one go, but just as a little introduction to yourself. Can you, can you just tell people who you are and a little bit maybe about Rails Bank and what you're doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Louisa Murray. I'm COO of UK and Europe for Rails Bank here in London. I've been with Rails Bank pretty much from the beginning when we were four people and we're now up to almost 500. Uh, so it's been an amazing journey, um, background very much, and we, uh, I'll chat about that at some point, no doubt, but very much in finance and trading and, and bumped into the co-founders in uh, the largest we work in the world at the time in Moorgate and got talking and um, realized it's, it was going to be a fantastic company, asked to join and help them out for a little while before they went live. And yeah, and now at Rouse Bank, we're growing all around the world. Um, we've got a big office here in London, uh, up in Newcastle, out in Southeast Asia, Lithuania and in the States. So yeah, really exciting times. Oh, fantastic. So I heard the story about when you met the founder of Rails Bank. Is this something to do with a, with a lift or an elevator? <laughs> well, yeah, not quite. Um, I was um, doing some pr- entrepreneurial things in, in the, that we work and, and somebody pointed him out as somebody who'd be very relevant to speak to in fintech. Um, so I went straight on LinkedIn and um, uh, went to link him with him and um, he didn't accept my LinkedIn invitation. <laughs> so uh, I left it a few days. Yeah. And, uh, and then I bumped, happened to bump into him in the lift. So I said, Hey, Hey, you didn't accept it. He said, I'm sure I did. <laughs> I said, no, you definitely did. And, and then we, uh, we started chatting and he introduced me to Clive, his, his co-founder and it just went from there. So yeah, if you don't say anything, you know, you, we could have, you know, I could have ignored that and, you know, I wouldn't be in this position now. No, absolutely. So let's just maybe rewind back a little bit then. So uh, to, to the sort of the early stages of your career. So you obviously come from a, a, a banking background of all places then, yeah? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I started many years ago, so in the in the late eighties, um, actually in stockbroking. Um, so it was a company then called Smith Barney, um, and I started as assistant 
there, you know, decided that finance, big bang had just happened. That's where I wanted to be in the city. And I started at Smith Barney. It was very much an uh, old fashioned UK, well, it's an American company, but in, in London, they're old fashioned stockbrokers. And after a few months, I said to um, one of the brokers there, a German guy, Oh, this is this is where I want to be. I want to be one of the brokers. You know, how long do you think until I can get there? And he said, "Well, I'm going to be honest with you, Lou. Never here. <laughs> uh, this is this is you know, you're a woman. That's just not going to happen here." Wow. Uh, he said, "However, you know, there are definitely other opportunities out there." And it, he'd heard of you know derivatives, um, interest rate swaps trading. Sure. And he had um, he had heard of somebody, another German guy actually, called Marcus Feder, who was looking to build a desk at CIBC in London, so the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce in London. And he was looking for some junior members of the team. So I went to meet, interview with him, got the job. And literally within a year or so, he'd mentored me and I had my own trading book. And, and in, in those days, it was the Deutschmark. Um, we grew the team from there, had some really good people come in. Another guy, Charles Colborne, a wonderful lady called Sue Story, who came over from Canada. And it was an exciting time to be in the city. And from then on, I went to Barclays, ostensibly to trade the Austrian shilling and Belgian francs, which I was almost a step down. But I, I'd been warned that the um, the Deutschmark trader was going to going to be leaving in the near future because of um, bonuses and things like that. So I was in the hot seat, ready to take on the Deutschmarks. And then, you know, as luck would have it, when we went into the Euros, obviously Deutschmarks was the biggest trading book, and and that's what I took on and um, and and grew my career with Barclays coming in one of the youngest directors there right okay fair enough then so uh you, did you ever see that guy who said you wouldn't go anywhere afterwards because you were you were a woman no god no no and then he wasn't saying it in a bad he was I, I, you'd love to bump into him now though wouldn't you well yeah absolutely and and uh, thankfully he told me then you know i could have hung around for a while and kept knocking at that door yeah um so so how much you know better to be broken it to me not so gently and and off i go and um you know know, know where i wanted to head and it's been a great career you know when i joined uh, and, and very much similar to how the tech scene is these days, there's hardly any women traders. Absolutely hardly any. And it was, you know, I think it was about nine or ten percent. Now, I'm not saying it's any different mm. in trading now. There's still, you know, a big minority of women traders, but it's very relevant and how it is now. And you know, I've got lots of stories about how we were treated, not not always badly, but um, you know, it's certainly tougher to get noticed. What did you learn from that period then, sort of the, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, being a woman in a male dominated dominated industry? Did that shape the way you are in terms of, you know, your because you're obviously, you're clearly a very driven person, you know, does it come from that period of your life, do you think? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and I hope I've passed that, pass that on to my children, you know, I've got boys and girls, um, that you, you're all equal, and you've got to help each other. So, you know, the women, women in the trading have got to help each other, but men have got to help women too. You know, you, 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 you've are, you've got to be judged on how good you are at something. Yeah. But, but others, and, and, and always there were some girls in the, the, uh, some ladies in the, the middle offices, the back offices that wanted to strive to get to those front offices and the, and the trading positions. And I would always be there to, um, give advice and, you know, pet talks and, um, yeah keeping everyone's strength up. So, um, yeah, look, I mean, I wanted to ask you about the most important milestones in your career then. In terms, We talked about learning and how that shaped you. Let's talk about this period right up until you set up the recruitment company. What were the most important milestones in, in that early early period of your life, of your career, sorry? Yeah, so, so, so obviously realizing that you're on the right career path yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I say to my children and lots of people that work for me, if you don't try things, you don't know what you don't like. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it'd be great if you can, you can do something and you, and it, you're fantastic at it and, and you love it and, um, and that, that's your career for life. But more often than not, you've got to try a few things. And I did try a few things and, and I was lucky that early on in my career, I found that part of my career I wanted to do. So, so finding that, having a successful career at the beginning, you know, then I got to my 40s and, and realized, you know, I, I did need to move on a little bit from trading. You're, you're always watching a screen and, you know, a couple of numbers. And I wanted to, you know, to try some, I suppose, more business 
orientated um, thing. So then it was great, to, again, to try a few things. You know, it, it, I, I started a fintech headhunters. I had some investments in renewable energy and things like that. But it was, you know, eventually meeting the guys at Rails Bank that uh, I found something I really, really was interested in and enjoyed. And and, and that that is an absolute bonus, isn't it? Absolutely. So, as you know, I'm a big fan of uh, the the lessons of the 2008 crisis. Okay, so talk talk us through your experience of that whole thing and that that period in the city of London. What was that period like generally? In a long career, it's another learning phase. Yeah, yeah. So you've seen we've seen lots of different things from you know the UK dropping out of the exchange rate mechanism, the financial crisis, Brexit. There's, you know, every few years, there's an absolutely enormous uh, occurrence that you learn mm. by. And, 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 and I think that's obviously the benefit of having a company like we've got now where uh, there's some gray hair. There may be only a couple in mine, but there's a lot more in the company. <laughs> yeah. So having some gray hair, it gives you experience and combine that with, you know, the young techies. It's, I think it, it's a, a really nice melting pot in the company. No, absolutely. So late 2008, you obviously had this idea from somewhere. I'm from a recruitment background myself, by the way, so I kind of know what you were, knew what you were thinking. Um, you were obviously you had this this idea potentially that you know you could be a headhunter in, in your sector. Talk us through that that thought process and that, that the early years of of setting up that that sort of company. Yeah, so um, I, I've always liked talking to people. That's one thing. I've always been good at bringing on people within the various um, departments that I've run. And I so have that innate interest in people and businesses. And, and one of the things I did do at the very beginning was do a lot of research. Uh, I wouldn't say I loved it as a business because I think um, there's some not so good bits apart about it, but the, the fabulous bits are meeting people who absolutely love you when they get them a good job. And then there's meeting the companies. And, and that's something I did. I literally went around a thousand companies, um, stood at their doors and, and, and it worked particularly well in the WeWorks at the beginning because there's lots of startups and everyone kind of had their doors open and you could stand at the doors and say, right, well, you know, what are you doing here? I'm not selling to you or anything, but I'm really interested with what you can, what you're doing. And, and, you know, 99% of companies and people want to talk about what they're doing, mm. you know, their hopes and dreams. And having had lots of experience with different people, you know, I can listen very well and, and, and talk about anything, whether it's football, whether it's, you know, gaming, where your people go on holiday, what, you know, what their hopes and dreams are. So that is the the lovely part, I think, of that particular business. It's, it's seeing companies grow and, and seeing people grow through their careers. Sure, absolutely. So what what was it like, though? Because you'd never, did you have any recruitment experience? In, nope. Right. So you obviously got into a sector whereby, you know, I've seen people get into recruitment from, from uh, other successful careers elsewhere, and they've really been shocked by, I always call it that the, the only sales job in the world where your product can change its mind uh, <laughs> and ignore your calls for a month. So, you know, it's, yes. um, you know, it's even, not even derivatives the, do not that. That's the fun bits of it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, how, yes. how did you deal with that culture change and that, that you know, it is, it is a testing role. It's kind of one of those roles. It's, it, recruitment is like easy in, in theory, but then difficult to get good at in practice, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think many, many, many fabulous sales careers start in recruitment, yeah. don't they? Because you you really do have to take you know you've got moving parts both sides haven't you yes and and a lot of human well, it's, it's all human emotions and and things like that so yeah it it, it was very hard going from a, a historically uh, financial role and and target driven role for numbers to people based so yeah it was very different but. You know, it, it's worked for me very well because I, you know, I headhunted myself into the Rouse Bank job. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, was that kind of like a lifestyle business for you then? Did you just do it as an independent? Because a lot, a lot of recruitment business owners do that. Or do you, did you have any aspirations to scale it? Or was that not really what you were, do, you were in it for? No, 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 absolutely. I did have lots of aspirations for it. I wouldn't do anything unless I, I thought there was a there was a longer term goal for it. But it was I think I was lucky in that I, you know, I tripped over fintech 
and saw that there was there was an enormous potential there. Yeah. You've got lots of companies growing, and to be able to combine the you know as I said before the grey hair and and the new way of working and new you know younger generation seemed ideal to me. So that that's what I concentrated on. Pretty much you know the, the C suite version of that. But it was it was good to find those combinations. So you strictly stuck to C suite roles with I wouldn't say strictly, but uh, yeah, that was where I was aiming for. So what was the biggest lesson you learned from eight years you spent in recruitment? Well, I didn't quite spend spend eight years because I was doing some other things as well. But that, one of the lessons that that's um, that's very uh, that hit home with me was that you got to keep at it all the oh, time yeah. there's not there's not a downtime it's, it's not a passive in income is it recruitment it really <laughs> isn't <laughs> it is it, it really work hard for your money and i think yeah. Yeah, having done long hours and lots of hard work in the trading world and you know it really is a uh, a seven till seven plus you know you get home and then you've got more work to do having done that for so many years it wasn't such a shock but it, it, you know, I suppose it was the relentlessness of yeah. keeping going until the last minute, with that never, never given up. Yeah, of course. And it's, uh, the crazy thing about recruitment is that you know that the more successful you get, the more busy you get, and it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, it is yeah, relentless yeah. is a great word. It it uh, it does actually represent ex- exactly how you feel. It's 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 like trading as well. You're going to have bad days, but you've got to get up the next morning and you know lift a fight the next day. Right, absolutely. So, did you have employees then by the time you'd finished, uh, or did you? Yeah, yeah. Did, what what happened to that business then? Yeah, so we, I had a couple of uh, ladies actually, and um, uh, one in in Spain, one in France. Um, oh, okay. Very much on the, the fintech. Yeah, we're just you know kind of winding things, seeing where we were going with it, and that's when I, I met Nigel and Clive. Sure. So, were you contingent labour as well? Or were you just all fee based per per me sort of stuff? Yeah, all fee based. Uh, and there was pan European then, yeah. I'm assuming you were working with companies all over the place. Yeah, but that was kind of you know that was five six years ago. Um, you know, nothing like you know FinTech is now. Yeah, but it's ballooned into something Absolutely. into its own beast now, isn't it? Let's come back to that in a minute. But I wanted to ask you about like the first couple of months then around you know you you joined pay net for a while yeah 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 so that's that's the regulated arm of of rails bank so before we launched the technology you know as with lots of these companies there's there's lots to do in the preparation and 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 you know as luck would have it when i when i joined um we had just got regulated as an emi yeah and that that was done under that that pay in it name which is now 100 percent owned by rails bank ah right so it was the acquisition as to how you got into rails bank then i take it so. yeah so we yeah we we all you know same same founders and everything so you know, set up a vehicle for a regulated entity and then alongside that the technology product is being built and, and paying as it's owned by rails bank you know is used you know to to provide that regulation that the company needs um to to function sure so and and all its customers no absolutely absolutely so Tell us about the purpose of Rails Bank then. What's the what? What, what are you guys? What what problem are you guys trying to solve? Yeah. So so we are all about embedded finance. Okay. Um, so embedding the financial experience into any type of customer, whether that's a brand, whether that's an insurance company, whether that's a new fintech neo bank, embed, helping them to embed it into their customer journey. Yeah, so we're purely at the ba- in the background of this, but we've built the technology, we've got the regulatory licenses, uh, we've got everything a company needs to provide that financial experience. So that that literally ranges from working, say, with a with a, with a new neo bank that wants to be able to issue. Uh, bank accounts and cards in the UK or be able to be able to do this in France or to be able to do this in Spain to a football club here potentially in the UK who wants to be able to embed a mechanism for its fans to get loyalty points pay for their season tickets and they kind of don't even know they're doing that. Sure. You know, it's all part of the customer journey. And so it becomes, yeah, becomes comes embedded in them. The brand is there. They know know what they're doing, but it's all just part of the journey. You know, see so you know, we see lots of the the buy now, pay later. 
yeah. type of scenarios. You know, I don't go on the, the apps to buy, buy now, pay later. Mm. I go on the app to buy, you know, amazing dress or something for, you know, my computer. And that's just embedded in the experience. If I want to do use buy now, pay later, it's just there sitting, you know, as easy as me paying by PayPal or as easy as me paying with my Visa debit card. And that's what we provide. All of that technology and, and regulatory experience and uh, to be able to do that. Right. I heard you picked up McLaren F1 recently as a client. That must have been quite exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I've got one of those cars. Actually, I should have bought it home. I could have showed you one of them. But yeah, we, we, you know, we've got lots of that <laughs> so, type sorry, of thing. Sorry, I can't let you move on from that. You've got a McLaren F1 that you were going to show me. No, I can't. <laughs> Not a car. Ah, I was so much more excited when I thought you said car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have put it in. <laughs> you could have actually done this podcast sitting in the McLaren F1. That would have been really that would have cool. Been good, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would have been really good. Well, I'll tell you what we did. We were at Web Summit the other week and we had the world champion of Keepy Uppy football oh god oh they, they're impressive those people i've seen yeah them, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so i should have he should have taught me some skills that i could have uh, had the <laughs> the interview doing that so is rails bank rail banks offering i kind of say it, rails banks offering completely white label then or do you have more yes. do you, have, you don't have any direct to business no so we are purely b2b yeah so we we allow our customers to concentrate on their customers so whether that's a customer buying an insurance policy, a fan, in a retail, you know, a shopper, that type of thing. So they 100% concentrate on, on their customers and that whole experience. And we're just providing, you know, for want of a better word, excuse me, the, the plumbing and things like that to, for them to do that. So myself and many of the listeners may have actually interacted with your technology and not really would, 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 would never know. You know what I mean? So uh... Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't, when you go to move money, say from, you know, I don't know if you've got a brother or a sister and you're all putting some money in for your mum or dad's birthday present, you don't say, I'm going to go and make a fun, I'm going to go make a UK files to payments now, do you? No, no, of course. You say, I'm just going to send them some money. Yeah. And, and depending who you're banking with, you know, that all goes on, those rails go all go on behind it. And that's that's what we work with. Lots of, you know, we've got you know in excess of three hundred customers globally that do that with us. It's all it's all about APIs for you guys then, I suppose, isn't it? You talk into all these different other websites and things and it, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. I'm sure, you know, this is this is a, a growing space, isn't it? I mean, um, so what do you think about the fintech space, especially in the UK at the moment then? This stuff going to decentralized finance seems to be popping up everywhere at the moment in cryptocurrencies. What are you most excited about in the fintech space right now? Yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about anything consumer driven. Yeah, so it's all about making things better for the consumer. So as I say, you know, whether that's a fan, a retailer, uh, you, know, you, you have to, every single company has to have that in mind. I mean, you know, some of our customers are, you know, dealing with corporates, but, you know, more often than not at the end of those, there's consumers as well. So any, anything that's consumer led, what can we do to help the customer journey? How can we make things frictionless, just part of, you know, the, the normal proceeds? We know that consumers want to deal with the brands they love and the companies they love and and any kind of company is a brand well, you know whether that is a football club someone on the PGA tour whether that's you know one of like plum one or or ricky guy our customers in the the wealth management space they're all brands in their own right yeah and we want to make life easier for all of those of course of course and i think yeah, I mean, in ten years, I think the, fi the fintech sector probably won't exist. Then it'll just be, it'll become, it'll fintech will be so normal that it'll be, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think. Yeah, and you'll 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 be unusual if you have to deal with the banks. Yes, of course, of course. I mean, the banks. I mean, the traditional banks, the sector that you came from, um, they don't seem to be able to keep up with the innovation of uh, companies like Rails Bank, do they? Well, it's it's legacy. Yeah, you're dealing with legacy technology and um, and everyone knows how, how tricky it is not only to change the technology, yeah. but to get buy-in from above as well. It'll be so interesting to see how this plays out and how Barclays and Lloyds, are, what, what are they going to look like in 10 years? I really don't know because, I mean, I'm sure... 
I'm, I know they are investing in lots of other fintechs and things. So I think they'll probably just, you know, do like what Facebook did and just rebrand and become something else possibly, you know, I don't know. But yeah, yeah. But long as they don't mention their own names, yeah. they're all right. <laughs> so let's talk about, I want to talk about sales, okay? You're obviously, yep. is featured throughout your career. So, you know, I, it does, I hate it when people say, oh, I can't be, I can't do sales. I'm not a salesperson. So, Louisa, c- can you just talk us through that um, transition from heading up the sales division of Rails Bank into the COO role? And how was that transition for you? And has your role changed very much? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it, it kind of goes back even further than the last role I had, which was a, a you know, a purely sales role before Rouse Bank and, and within Rouse Bank. And that I've always been into, you know, hybrid roles. Even when I was trading, you know, there was lots of things I had to do to get the sales team on my side. You wanted them out there, you know, selling your product. So I would always be involved in any customer meetings, give good prices, you know, get a good team going behind me. When I took over the COO role at Rails Bank, as I had ostensibly had very target driven roles before in trading and sales, you know, and I I was a little bit wary, a little bit wary, but Nigel, uh, the CEO of Rails Bank, was, you know, was very clear in that the COO role would be quite target driven and, and, and not just on revenue, but how, you know, we shape the company. So, you know, net dollar retention uh, for our customers, you know, employee experience, all these type of things feed into this role now. So, you know, it makes it a really varied role, but still got some sales elements to it as well. I, I meet lots of the brands at the beginning, do lots of door openings. I do fun things like this as well. Um, sure. So it's, yeah, it's 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 a great varied role. Absolutely. So I, it's quite strange, I thought, just as an observation, most people that I know of who will go into COO positions tend to come from either a HR background or more of a traditional operations background. So I think I, quite quite refreshing that you come from the background that you do but so let's talk about that background very quickly about sales and your perception of what sales is and things um well actually yeah can we can we ask that question what is sales and what makes a good salesperson in your opinion louisa yeah so so a good salesperson um and we've got a few at rouse bank i have to say um a good salesperson needs to have tenacity ability to read a situation what we do at rouse bank it's not two prices there's sure. lots of different products behind it there's lots to it lots of moving parts so to be able to read a situation read a, read the problem we're trying to solve or you know kind of read the hopes and dreams of of where the where the customer wants to get to so you've got to be sharp really sharp as a salesperson very likable as well sure. you know i've been on the other side and <laughs> It's 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 tricky to buy from people who are not so likable or you know not good. Mm, so it's mm. it's being able to understand your product, understand your market, and you know keep going. There's you know tenacity and perseverance, isn't it? Absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, no, I completely agree. How how do you think a sa- the sales role has changed in the last sort of fifteen years? Then I mean, obviously we've gone from this analog world into this digital world. Uh, have other skills become more important now, like written skills, for example, and you know the, the ability to engage online? surely have become more important now absolutely well i mean to reach people for starters yeah, yeah. it's 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 the, i mean the, there still is some outgoing calling but i bet you get the odd cold call coming in louisa don't you <laughs> <laughs> i do quite a few uh, yeah. but i understand that but uh, to being able to reach people to stand out from the norm you know let people know you know what we're there to do we've always been to the money 2020 fintech conference We've always been there oh, okay people know us everyone and you know this year we had the, the racing car fabulous what we've also done more recently when we've we've done some rebranding and, and announced our, our category is we went to web summit now people don't necessarily know Ralph's bank who go to web summit it's a huge you know forty thousand footfall so we had to stand out there you know we had lots of announcements nigel did a great uh, panel with um, the ceo Alejandro Agag of um, Formula E. So that was some great things. But also actually on the pitch, as it were, at Web Summit, we needed to stand out. 
We had a great stad. We're all there in our Rousebank you know, kit, vendor wear in, in old words, but we're all there in our, in our uh, Rousebank kit. And we also had the, the world champion at Keepy Uppy. So it, <laughs> it started, you know, lots of lots of social media was there. And, you know, things like that have changed. No way would we have been doing that 15 years ago. Hi, just a quick reminder that you're listening to the Tech Leaders Podcast. The Tech Leaders Podcast would like to thank Tramshed Tech, who allow us to use their world-class recording studio facilities. We cannot recommend them enough. They also provide office spaces and events, so make sure you go and check them out. Now, back to Gareth, who will be quizzing our guests on some of the industry's most topical questions. But I think the new digital generation are going to have the, these skills by default, aren't they? Yeah. So it's not of a transition for them no. but uh, but yeah look let's talk about the pandemic it's been a very testing 18 months for everybody what was your experience of the lockdown periods and what did uh, rails bank take from this time that they, that they will implement going forward sure so i love an office <laughs> and i literally <laughs> did go kicking and screaming into lockdown yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah that the, the, one of my uh, one of my colleagues kareen was the same as me and we were sitting there and uh, in March, we said, I think this is going to be our last day, Kareem. We're going to have to go home now. Uh, so we, we did it kicking and screaming, you know, didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know where we're, whether we'd have to, you know, lay some people off. We didn't actually have to do that off you know it it really was off to the races after that everything was coming more digitalized you know we went into the pandemic at about 120 people and we've come out of it at 500 I mean obviously the pandemic's still going but you know we've got 500 people so the business has grown enormously what I would say the learnings from it is that productivity went up very sharply you know no people didn't have anything else to do and everyone embraced having you know a great job being at a great company uh where we are now is that you know we've expanded so much we know things have changed we will as you know most companies will do have a hybrid way of working we've got a new headquarters here in london uh well, i've kitted it out. i think it's about 150 people i've kitted it out for 70 and i could see that you know the last few days actually in it we've been up to that 70 almost and people want to come back albeit you know on a part-time basis so um, you know course. embrace that you know we want to get people into the Rousebank culture uh, have fun together you know I hired a team out in Munich 35 people we hadn't met them until August you know they'd been with us 10 months so we went out there we did some mountain climbing you know it was great fun we need to do more things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I completely agree. So you guys have, have, have sort of implemented a hybrid model now then. Yeah. Uh, what is it, two, three day split or something like that? Yeah. So lots of collaborating in the office, book a desk and you, your your group has its own kind of bunch of desks, book a desk, in, come in um, one or two days a week, do some working, do some collaborating, have some meetings. And they'd have a beer. Why not? It's so important to do that. And, and serendipity as well. They call it the water cooler effect. I mean, there's so many great ideas come from serendipitous conversations in, in, in an office environment, don't they? And that kind of, you lose that. You can sort stuff out so much quicker in an office. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, I know you guys, uh, or certainly in your team, I, I believe, Louisa, you, you're proactively trying to hire more women. And this is a good segue into the, uh, the women in tech uh, conversation. But I think hire more women who've had sort of career breaks or, you know, obviously extended maternity or whatever, and just provide some more flexibility to get more women into your tech organization. Can you walk us through that, what you've done to create a bit more of a gender balance? Yeah, absolutely. So I have hired a lot of women who've been on career breaks and they've been fantastic. Lots of people have done that, but you know, in particular, the ones I've hired have been absolutely amazing. They come with past experiences, obviously not in fintech because there was no such thing then, but they come with, with lots of different experiences and, and, and it brings a really rounded element to the team. Lots of different backgrounds, but everyone, you know, is totally engaged and, and you know, we've we've just had one lady have a baby, but there's you know a bunch of us, fifteen of us, that have been there, done that one. We you know we're out the other end and everything. But you know, you bring sure. much this you know advising. This is how you can do it. You know, have as much time as you want off and everything. You need 
people who've had experience around you and, and, that, and that's what I hope to do. And, and at the say, they've been them, our most productive employees as well. But, you know, even more has got to be done. Absolute, you know, we've got to encourage as many women as we can to get back into it. It's got to start with women, but the men, the men have got to, to help us do that too. Absolutely. Well, that, that's a good segue into this conversation about women in tech. And, you know, obviously, I think it's women in general coming into the workforce in male dominated industries that transcends just tech. But obviously, because we're in the tech sector, the ONS come out with some employment data this year, which said that 31% of UK tech jobs are held by women, which is still, you know, not good enough, is it? I mean, like I said to you in the in the lead up to the show, you know, when I was in school, girls were better at maths than boys were. So, which you know, just I'm, I'm thinking, obviously, you know, in terms of going into engineering based careers. But obviously, as we know, there's a lot more to tech in the tech world than just engineering. But what I'm saying is, I can't see any justifiable reason why there would be such a low percentage of of the the workforce being, you know, female. How are you finding it you know, in terms of like, providing a, a macro? commentary on this in terms of the, the tech industry specifically is enough being done what is being done and how can we get better at ensuring that young I, i've got two daughters you know i'd love them to get into the tech industry um we need to make the tech industry a bit more accessible so how do we do that and how much is being done right now yeah and, and i suppose we've got to think tech industry isn't just engineers yeah it's there's lots of there's lots of different jobs within that and i, I think often that's that's not quite clear to people going into the industry so there's there's some great roles whether you want to be an engineer or a data scientist fantastic you know and that has to start early on in education it really has to um you know it's got it's got to be in schools preschools that these you know you don't see five-year-old girls you know holding a picture of somebody who's invented a laptop and all things like this you know this this there's those role models are not there the disney princesses are not there but so it goes all the way back to that but then actually when you you know you leave university schools and everything i think it's it, you know it's there's there's a lot to be done uh, about the face of technology and technology companies you know there's marketing within these companies there's sales there's customer success there's data science there is HR across and legal, you know, our, our, most of our legal team, bar one, is a, is a female. And, and everyone's, you know, into technology. We'll have to use it within that, you know, within this job. So just because we're not coding every day doesn't mean to say we're not into technology. And I, I think it's bringing, widening, keeping the jobs fluid within the company as well. We might start, you might start as a customer success person, but that doesn't mean to say with the right help, you can't go into being an analyst or, you know, data scientist and things. And that's, that's what I really do promote within the company progression. And that doesn't have to be progression straight up through one vertical of career. It can be across the company as well. You know, we've had, we've had people move from being in the launch to compliance and, and all different things like that. And, And as long as they can see the types of jobs and the skills with them, um, the type of people mm. that do these jobs. I think that's really important. The education system. Do you think that it's a little bit in a position whereby it does encourage girls to go into more traditional, stereotypical careers for women, and we need to change things a little bit? So, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, it's not good enough. Can, can you just go through your hundred percent? My my daughter. My daughter went to uh, a girls' school that went to a boys grammar school for her sixth form she had to get higher marks to do stem subjects in that boys grammar school than the boys did wow really yep that's still yep. going on that's that's insane oh yes yeah. so and that was economics and maths the girls moving into that school had to have higher marks than the boys i don't understand how the the school would justify that though i mean that's that's doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't know if I'm missing something there, but um, so wow, is is this sort of endemic across the education system? Do you think? Because they only have a certain amount of, say, economic teachers or ah, something, okay. and they, they gave um, you know preference to the boys who were already at the school. So for the girl to slip into that, they had to be better than most of the boys. So do you think this is? endemic across the education system and do you is, is there any lobbying going on to to stop things like this from happening oh i'm i'm sure there are i'm sure there are that doesn't mean to say um, there's lobbying going on a lot of lot of yeah, things yeah. but doesn't mean to say it's a perfect world wow okay 
So, um, I mean, well, that that's quite shocking. And I think um, clearly there's, there's work to be done. I mean, what do you think about posts? Obviously, the education system is what it is, and hopefully we will see it modernized to keep up with the, the labor market. And, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there. But in terms of the post-education system, the early years of, of maybe girls' careers, you know what I mean? Is it, what, what do you think about, uh, what would you call them, societies and things setting up to, to encourage girls, like girls in code, black women in tech was one we discussed before. Um, there's lots of things like this popping up. So this stuff being done in, in, in industry, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. There are, and there's some great people around, um, role models and things like that and you know I think it's so important you know I get you know I look back you know 30 years in my career and I had role models it's just so important that you have those women and you know are, are, are pulling other women up with them as well when you're hiring for a job you want the best person for that job you can't get away from that fact you have to you have to go that but you've also got to promote within within and you know and, and, and educate others about you know what can be done you know, don't don't limit yourself. There's lots out there in the world. And, you know, just because you go on one career path does not mean to say you have to stay on that. You know, there's lots of twists and turns of career paths, ups and downs. You know, I've, I've lived it uh, as a woman. Maybe there are more. Mm. But um, lots. There's hope. There's, you know, it's, it's getting better. It's getting better. Not but quick not quick enough. No, enough. I agree. So let's talk about leadership roles very quickly to finish on this subject then. So you're obviously, you know, very successful, got, you know, you're, you're a C-level exec in a high growth fintech, you know, clearly there's nowhere near enough women in the boardroom. I think it's probably quite obvious that, you know, having a more diverse boardroom generally ends up with a better decision making. What are sort of the, the more the, the newer companies like uh, the fintech companies and more sort of uh, companies been set up in the, in the last 10 years? Are you seeing a, a, a noticeable improvement in the, the amount of female C-level execs? Or do you think it's we still way off? Yeah, I think it's getting better. I mean, we've we've got some amazing women on our board, some really varied careers. You know, one of them was you know one of the first people in Facebook, or another's in Israel, got a fund there, and another one's out in Southeast Asia. You know, head of risk, a standard chart, and everything. So we've we've got, I would say, uh, one of the strongest women boards out there so I think I think everyone recognizes that you know as I say before maybe some haven't recognized it quick enough and uh, good women to be snapped up if they don't move quicker no absolutely uh, I think the Harvey Nash came out did a tech survey this year and said that 10 percent of leadership roles in tech are held by women which I, I don't know you know where they got that data from but that's what they said but I think you know it, what even if that's true even if it's double that if it's 20 percent it's still way too low yes um, where, I mean it's so basically I mean I think the problem is here Louisa we need to it, it's yes of course men need to give women accessibility to leadership careers but also we need more women wanting to do that and I think that starts early on by making sure they're driven, ambitious, and they see the summit and they want to get to the summit. You know what I mean? And uh, I think that's uh, we're probably quite far away from that, aren't we? But uh, but there's still there's so much we could do about it, though. You know. So, but th- let's see, and ho- hopefully we can uh, we can see some improvement over the next couple of years. So so let's get the crystal ball out then, Louisa. Okay, I'm keen to get your thoughts on how our Rails Bank gonna look in five years. What do you think? That the organization will look like in five years? Gosh, uh, well, we've come some, such a long way in such a short period of time. So I dread to think in, you know, in the nicest possible way. Um, I reckon we'll be a few thousand people. I hope that we've um, cemented ourselves as a number one embedded finance experience provider and been able to do that globally. So, you know, we're live in, in, in the States, UK, Europe now, Australia and Singapore. So I hope we've added some other geographies to that as well. But yeah, I suppose it, it, it's really seen as, a, as an employer of choice as well so that you know we're well well known for our culture our people and uh, as somewhere that you know people can see you know they'll have a fabulous career fantastic what about products and services then do you think you you guys will branch out into something aside from embedded finance within b2b do you think you do you think there's other things there maybe in the b2c world that you could tap into at some point uh well ultimately everything is to the c's 
but I think you know other products. You know, we 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 are uh, very much into the credit side of this, so kind of credit for good, and uh, again embedding it in that finance experience. Potentially some more currencies, maybe even insurance, embedded insurance, embedded investments. But it's all pointing at the customer and what they want. Yeah, sure. So just whatever the customer trends go, Rails Bank, I suppose, will go as well, won't it? <laughs> well, you, there's no point building products that no one wants, is there? So, yeah. So, what about look? Decentralization seems to be happening. Okay, you know, much to the annoyance of sort of you know many sort of uh, stalwarts across different industries, banks being the particular one in your industry. Decentralization seems to be you know not a fad. It seems to be here to stay. Cryptocurrencies seem to be getting stronger and stronger. Do you have any thoughts on DeFi and, and crypto and, and where where is all this going to end up? Uh, I don't think it will end up anyway. I think there's, there's lots more to come in it. You know, I looked at it five years ago and maybe if I'd been a bit younger, I'd been all over it in those days. But I think it's part of the future. I'm not saying it's the only mm. future, but it's definitely part of it. It's not disappearing down the plug hole. It's there and and it, and it, it just it widens out more experiences for different people. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it can change the economics in some ways. Some of the tech's a bit slow, but it's better experiences for people. And, and you know, we've got quite a few number of some of these big digital companies as our customers. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's by providing that embedded finance into their experiences. So whether that's onboarding for their customers to buy a cryptocurrency or, you know, offboarding, uh, on-ramping and off-ramping, I mean, rather than onboarding and off-boarding, but on-ramping sure. to buy currency or off-ramping, you know, we provide all that. A card where they can spend, uh, whether it's a digital currency or, you know, the fiat when they move out of that currency. So that's that's all part of the stuff we, all, we, we can do. You're already and, doing that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have been for a couple of years. So what do you think is the... the- the, the next frontier of technology innovation in the fintech space then what what do you what part of fintech do you think is going to really accelerate over the next couple of years i think it's very much about customer driven products yeah so which part of it you know it's, it's not not so sort of it's destabilizing banks or anything like that it's just making things better yeah yeah, making it easier to do things giving other types of companies the ability to do these things yeah yeah so it's you know things like brands or you know i'm a nike or adidas or anything like that i i don't know the art of the possible but by bringing fintech into the mix we can show them what can be done i mean they might not they, they might not think they've got problems at all they, you know they, i'm sure they've got amazing profit margins and things like that but there's deeper engagement with their customers sure. and that's can be provided by fintech yeah absolutely the, the winner in all this is the consumer isn't it i think it it's, is uh, it really I is mean, some of the things some of the services that are available these days were just uh i mean even like things like trading from you you know obviously you know this world yeah i mean i can jump on an, on an app now and have you know have financial trading information being fed into me for that it would, oh, it would be exclusive to people like you from 1990s, you know. <laughs> you, Absolutely. People like me wouldn't get that knowledge, you know what I mean? So. No, but you can even use some of those traders in your trading yeah, as well. So sure. you can, you know, you can piggyback off of, you know, I think eToro and a few things uh, like yeah, that, don't I they? Saw you can that. Piggy, piggyback off of the good yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. So I can basically click copy on uh, John, uh, what's his name, Paul, Paul Tudor <laughs> Jones or Stan Druckenmiller exactly. and basically just yeah, copy yeah, their strategy yeah. with my... I love what he does, minus like a million yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be doing it with 50 quid. You'd be doing it with 50 billion probably. But um, yeah, yeah. but yeah, so I think, yes, it's really exciting stuff there. Well, what do you think, just, just in terms of the, the general macroeconomic picture, I don't know how much you're into this stuff, but I think I, one thing that concerns me is the amount of money that's been printed in the last 18 months. I was looking at the M2 money supply of US dollars i think 30 to 35 percent of the entire supply was printed in between 20 between the beginning the beginning of the first lockdown up until recently so like 18 month period or whatever it was is that amount of money printing and subsequent debasement of fiat currency going to cause an enormous problem that we're are we just kicking the can down the road or do you think it's all yeah probably probably i mean i suppose you know, from our from our side, we're very pro what um, you know what's been going on in um, the fintech space in the UK. 
um, you know, d- deeply disappointed about Brexit, I have to say, personally, sure. but that's my own personal yeah, view. Sure. And what it did to the markets there, so made, you know, the majority of our customers who had that ambition to be more than just a UK company, it made them have to set up in, in Europe, become regulated in Europe. So all those types of things, yeah. you know, have caused a lot of work, but, you know, you needed to do it. You know, rather than just marketing to 60 million people, you want to be marketing to 360 million people, awesome. don't you? So, you know, that that's really where we've we've concentrated our efforts on helping our customers, you know, become global. And, you know, there's obviously various economic situations all around the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think there's going to be some fun to come over the next uh, couple of years. Absolutely. The one impact of the fintech sector that I hope starts to take hold over the next 10 years is basically just reducing inequality across um, you know, developing nations. You know, there's still people in this world who are starving to death. And it's, you know, it's just ridiculous with the amount of wealth we've yes. got in the West, isn't it? So I'm hoping that um, the democratization of information, the internet will, will really start to reduce this insane gap between, Absolutely. you know, uh, people in the West and people in maybe some, you know, Eastern African countries, for example, yes. or other, there are there are others. Yeah. Or in Asia. I mean, that was yeah, one of, of the course. reasons we set up in Asia, because of you know the kind of products and you know how much the unit economics come down by using fintech it, mm. it widens up that this world you know whether it's the unbanked or the lesser banked areas you know especially you know go back to the women saving and things like that it, it is it's a t- you know the aim is t- total democratization of yeah. finance globally can you imagine the talent that is untapped from those countries because a, a lot of these countries right the, there is lots of poverty but a lot of them have still got mobile phones and if you've got a mobile phone then you can tap yeah. into anything, can't you? Can you imagine the yeah. talent that you know that could be that, that could be realised? Yeah, and the diversification of companies and things. Absolutely. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's different ideas and things. It's, there's so much more to it, isn't there? Absolutely. Right. Let's talk about Louisa outside Ooh, of work. There's, there's not much of that. Obviously, you've got a cold today. So. <laughs> 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 what What are you into? What are you interested in? What What generally occupies your non business time? Um, um, oh, well, I suppose, well, I've just moved house up to Suffolk. So Lovely. I'm kind of discovering the Suffolk countryside. I haven't had a lot of time to do that yet, but that's that's my plans for this year. I've got three children. I'm a single parent, three children, all at university. So they keep me keep me poor and happy um <laughs> but uh, yeah lots of lots of sport I have you know I've had years of watching sport with them so now it's time for me to to try and get back into it so I'm a tennis player oh, okay yeah yep yeah, yeah and yeah lots of tennis walking that type of thing that's where I'm aiming to get to good stuff keep yourself active yeah Fitbit was a game changer for me keeping an eye on how many steps you're doing <laughs> was it oh yeah, people get addicted to that though, yeah they? they do a bit I'm addicted to the sleep analysis at the moment it, uh, <laughs> yeah you completely overanalyze your sleep but uh, but there we go so what career advice would you give to 21 year old Louisa oh dear well I would I would say always put yourself forward for anything yeah, absolutely. You know, get out of your comfort zone. Mm. You've got to try different things. You've got to volunteer. You've got to put your hand up. And, you know, I am not one for speaking out in front of people, but you know, I've had to do it, and uh, it gets easier. Um, it's sure. never, you're never, you're never going to love it. But if you're not that way inclined, but it gets easier. I say career paths are. I think I said it before. They're windy and they're hilly. So you know, don't get discouraged if you're you know if you get into something you you know you're not pretty happy with try something else absolutely try something else and it may be the wrong thing as well but you've ticked two things off of your list that you don't want to do but yeah always put yourself forward and um and and learn as you go fantastic advice i'm sure that's um yeah i'm sure that will inspire people for sure so what person anecdote or book or story have you been inspired by louisa so lots of different things really um probably too many to if i can't even remember lots of them uh as a child i was always inspired my favorite book i've got four or no i've got 10 different copies of it and that's little women funnily enough okay Uh, i've got loads of copies of it absolutely love that book and that inspired me in, in many different ways but when i when i actually started in the city uh, I had a wonderful lady that I mentioned, uh, and some men 
really, really, really good team at CIBC, but a wonderful lady called Sue Story who had moved to Ireland, moved from Ireland to uh, Canada on her own when she was a teenager, and then she came over and and and, um, and uh, we started working with her for a while in London. I think she had a, you know, three months working with her, and she really showed me what it was like to be a female trader not aggressive but forceful um ambitious and, and a really good fun person as well with it so learned lots from her and you know carried that on throughout my career and who's the author of little women so i can we can put that in the show notes <laughs> louisa m alcott oh so it's the, the same name as you as well so uh yeah louisa m alcott okay great we'll pop alcott that. yeah i think my i think my mum bought it for me my mum and dad bought it for me when i was about six or seven years old and and then if i ever go into a shop i'll always buy a different and see it there like an older version i'll always buy it sure fantastic so where can people connect with you and find out the, all the cool things that a rails bank are doing at the moment yeah so i'm, I'm big on linkedin I have to say, well, I'm I'm into LinkedIn. I'm not said I'm big on LinkedIn, but I'm into LinkedIn. <laughs> you were a recruiter, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, okay, fantastic. Well, look, I really enjoyed chatting to you, Louisa, and I know you're uh, not exactly, uh, you know, uh, yourself today. I know you're, you're suffering a bit yeah. with a cold. So I really appreciate you doing the show. Uh, and oh, it's um, a pleasure. Soldiering through. Uh, amidst, <laughs> amidst all the coughing and things but no you, you've you been absolutely great and I've really enjoyed this conversation so thank you so much oh thank you so much thank you for coming thank on the you. show I really enjoyed it as too likewise okay brilliant but uh, thanks Louisa bye bye thanks for listening to the Tech Leaders podcast with your host Gareth Davies we hope you enjoyed our deep dive into all things tech if you're keen to learn more make sure you tune in to our next episode a huge shout out to Be Digital who make this podcast possible. Go check them out at bedigitaluk.com to gain expert help on enabling your organisation to become lean, agile and attract the right talent. That's bedigitaluk.com. Join the tech revolution with the Tech Leaders podcast.